man, I, we don't need to have a specific thing that we're supposed to do. We're just talking, man. It's just, we, don't, we don't need an agenda. It's just a couple guys talking. Just a couple guys talking. Hey, uh, we haven't talked officially in any kind of like podcast capacity in a long time. We, we've had Bitcoin conversations with a bunch of yeah. other guys, but yeah. just the two of us. I mean, we had Fridays with TK for years. We had office hours for years. And yep. uh, it's been a while. And we're both kind of doing different stuff lately. So I don't know. I just wanted to, I just wanted to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, set, you set up this, you set up this conversation just so you could see me. <laughs> yeah. Cause I knew, I knew if I just kept trying to call you, you'd be too busy. But if I'm like, Hey man, let's get on a podcast. You're like, great. promoting my brand. You know? I'm just using it for, you know how people say you can use podcasts to learn from experts. I'm just now at this point using them just to talk to my friends because they won't talk to me otherwise. Um, hey man, well, 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 one of the things that, that somebody we, we both uh, hold near and dear in common is uh, Kobe talked about that. He was like, there's just this point where he got where it's just almost impossible to be friends with somebody if it's not over a project. If y'all not working on the same thing or like yeah. trying to do stuff, it's just hard, man. Yeah. So we got to do podcasts to, to socialize. So I do yeah. want to catch up like just for me personally, because I'm asking yeah. these questions because I genuinely don't know. I'm not, I'm not pretending <laughs> for an audience. Uh, what are you doing lately? So you got a lot of stuff. You are, I think I can say this now, you are officially uh, no longer uh, with Praxis, right? That's okay to, to say you have, have moved <laughs> to, to greener pastures, right? <laughs> well, well, Hey man, I mean, you know, Praxis is, is, is family. You know what I mean? So I, I, there is a sense in which I don't know what it means to say no longer part of it, but yeah, yeah in yeah. terms of, in terms of day to day work, where, where my focus is, I'm, I'm, I'm not on, you know, operation side of things, you know, I'm not managing the, the curriculum and the community experience and doing all those things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm now focusing on, you know, a lot of my education work, a lot of my entrepreneurial work. You know, uh, mo most of which right now is taking place through the revolution of one project that I'm doing with Fee. So, so both of us are just like, we're like the old guys now, you know, sitting on the sidelines, like, yeah, keeping an eye on Praxis, uh, helping, helping the kids out every once in a while, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not, not in the day-to-day -day trenches anymore. It's a, it's a weird feeling, man. That was quite a run. Um, okay, so yeah. tell me more about the things that you're doing, because I'm seeing you like, you're all over the place now. So you're, you're doing... Uh, a bunch of podcasts with the minimalist. You're doing like live videos on Twitter. You're doing a lot of stuff for fee. Like what is your, what's your current world? What are you up to? And, and yeah. where are you trying to take it? Yeah, man. Hey, you know, you know, I'm just, I'm just out here doing me. You know what I mean? I'm just out <laughs> here. <laughs> I'm just out here making that bread. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, remember you sent me this, uh, my Sean Lynch, uh, clip. Yeah. And, and I don't even know what the context of it w was for, but he was on some, um, like a post game conference and he was just, he was just giving advice to young, young cats, young players. And he was like, that's why you got to take care of your mentals. Yep. He's like, take care of your chicken. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I, I had to ask you what that meant. I was like, what does take care of your chicken mean? <laughs> And yeah, you man. just knew instinctively somehow. So that's what you've been doing, taking care of your mentals, taking care of your chicken. Yeah, man, that's it. That's it. That's, 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 all, that's all a man needs to do in life is take care of his mind and, and make sure he puts himself to good work. <laughs> okay, so it's so funny that you happen to mention Marshawn Lynch because I just watched the final, uh, the season finale of season three of Westworld. Don't spoil it, though. Don't spoil it. I won't I spoil anything except yeah. that Marshawn Lynch is in season three of Westworld. <laughs> <laughs> he is as a football player he was like the quietest most reclusive guy ever and like he actually got fined several times because during interviews he just wouldn't answer any questions he'd just sit there and stare and and then i see him and he's like this role like just a very small side character but he's an he's an actor in westworld and i was like what the, that's marshawn lynch what in the world anyway hey, I, I got i got one quick question about westworld so i remember watching one season one i was like whoa this this might be up there in the conversation for best best show ever. This is part of the debate for me. Uh, I'm already into sci-fi and stuff like that. Then I watched season two, and it and it felt like it fell off a little bit to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, I just don't feel like it was as good. Do you feel that 
season three? Well, well, did you feel that way about season two? Do you feel that season three really picks it up and carries it forward? And, and do I need to go back and rewatch season two since it's been like a year before I can dive in? Man, that's tough because I feel like season two – it lost something in terms of just straightforward, like emotional impact and like, damn, this is good. But it added a, so much complexity, which isn't always good, right? Like the show Lost kind of got near the end where it was like almost just too complicated. Every mystery led to two more mysteries and it just be like, I still love it. I never speak ill of Lost. I think it's one of the greatest shows ever. And I even like the way it ended, but you can, and that, I felt like Westworld kind of had that problem where it, it layered so much complexity into the plot and the multiple plots going on that it lost a little bit of the like oomph to it. Um, so season two was definitely weaker, even though, even though like intellectually, maybe even more interesting, just weaker as a show. Um, season three, I still don't know what I think of season three. It's, it's simpler again, but it's a very different show. It's almost, it's like almost like an entirely different show from season one. It like, it changes the nature of the whole series by just taking it in a, in a different direction. It's got a different aesthetic and it's a very, it's a very heavy kind of somber, reflective sort of vibe to it. Um, almost ominous in a, even a more ominous uh, than, the, than the first two seasons. Um, I think they, they lost all the complexity of season two. It's not nearly as, as complicated. And maybe a little disappointing in the, the main thought experiment that they're playing with in season three is one that is maybe a little less interesting and a little bit more tried in sci-fi. But it's still, like, I'm not ready to say oh, the show's done now. Like, it's still good. I'm still glad I watched it. I still think it's better than almost anything else on TV, and I'm looking forward to season four. Um, it was a little disturbing how much it paralleled events that are actually happening in the world right now. <laughs> interesting. Real interesting. I won't tell you anything else about it, but anyway. That was a, okay, okay. We're going to get off of that. We're going to get on to what I just said. Events happening in the world today. Yeah. I, I asked you something uh, in a, just a chat, like, I don't remember what it was, but you just said, you said, oh my gosh, my DMs have been blowing up basically ever since all this shit with like police brutality, George Floyd, all of the protests and things. What, what's blowing up in your DMs? What have you been mostly talking with people about? And like, what is your take on this entire situation? Yeah. So uh, a, a big part of that is, is I just got back from LA. I went to LA and, um, I recorded a conversation with the minimalist about, you know, race relations in America, about the protests, the riots, and all the debates and, uh, you know, discussions that's happened around that. And there are a lot of people who resonated with, with my point of view. And, and I also think there were a lot of people who, who really liked the way we were able to talk about it. Because I've had conversations with Josh and Ryan before. We all come from three different political philosophies, if you will. And we're able to have conversations about things like this, things that have political implication, things that require us to kind of take a stand on what we do and do not believe. And we can do it in a way that doesn't feel threatened, that, that doesn't feel defensive. And where people who are listening can walk away saying, hey, look, maybe I still disagree with you, you, you about this or that, but you know, I picked up a really useful conceptual distinction or you explain something to me that I used to get mad about, but it now makes sense. And so I've had a lot of really positive feedback about that. But then I've also had a lot of people who said, hey, I would love for you to come on my platform or maybe come to my church or come to my group, my event, and, and talk about those ideas because I, I think you have uh, something you know, to, interesting and unique to say. But what's most interesting to me about it is uh, you know, I, I think as a black man, especially, I, I know you love sentences that start with as a dot, dot, dot. So <laughs> I, I, as soon as I said that, I immediately felt <laughs> self-conscious because I try very hard not to start any sentences with as a, <laughs> so, so unnecessary. You can see that I'm a black man. 
I don't I don't give any any further credibility to it as a, <laughs> as a black man. But um but but look, as a friend of a black man, let me just tell you. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, look, so I'll explain what I'm trying to say in terms of TV. So this is episode of Blackish where uh where the, the, the main character Dre, he works as a marketing he works for a marketing firm. And he's for the most part, the only black guy in a higher level position. There's one other guy. And, and they tell him he's going to get a promotion. And, uh, and he's so pumped up. He's telling his family, like, yeah, they finally see me as part of the team. I'm about to get a promotion. And then he finds out they want him to be, like, the head of minority affairs. <laughs> and he's like, wait, I'm promoted to be the head of black people stuff? <laughs> right? <laughs> and so when you're, <laughs> when, when you're a black person, and you're called on during times like this to talk about race. Um, it, it can actually be a very awkward or uncomfortable or, or funny kind of thing because you don't want to be the token. You don't want to be the, oh, okay, you know, here's the black guy. Can you be the one to talk about the black issues? But for me, and this is something that you and I've talked about for, for years, my career has kind of had the opposite direction. Whereas some people, start off talking a lot about race and then they want to go mainstream and be thought of as someone and, the, and they feel like they can never escape that just always be in the the black guy who talks about black issues or whatever yeah yeah i've never been in that box i've never been afraid of being in that box i i have always been more known for talking about things that aren't directly related to race and that aren't directly related to politics and, and you're I'm ready to get racial Damn it. I'm ready to get racial, man. And when I see people in these conversations, I sometimes think, man, like there's just something missing. There, there, there's just a whole lot of stuff that isn't getting said. So a lot of things that are being said need to be said, but there's so much missing. And so I've kind of been chomping at the bit to get in this discussion. And so I'm really leaning into it. I, I have been asked, I mean, I have been asking to be a part of these discussions. I've been knocking on other people's doors saying, yo, I want to talk about black lives. I want to talk about race. I want to talk with you. I want to have the debates. I want to have the discussions. Is it all I want to do? Absolutely not. You know, do I believe that, you know, um, you know, this is the main thing God created me for? Absolutely not. But it's very much connected to some other causes and concerns that are important to me. Uh, one of them being, you know, my mantra that black dreams keep me awake at night. You know, um, I, I, I don't believe that talking about the unique challenges in black communities is something that has to, has to be framed as, yo, white people, this is what y'all need to do. Um, I, I think it's quite okay to be a human being and to acknowledge that there are certain problems that, that break your heart more than other problems. In, in the same way that if you say, I wanna devote my life to cancer research versus you know, the millions of other problems you can try to solve. Or like, you know, I'm just, I just, my heart really goes out to uh, young men without fathers. And I really want to do something to help, you know, their unique struggles, right? That's not, that's not like, hey, women, listen up, you know, you got to do this. It's like, no, I just have a particular burden for this, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's how I feel about young black men, you know? Um, I, I've always been kind of annoyed and frustrated by, um you know, the, the, the way I feel young black men are, are kind of seen, uh, the way young black men are, are educated. And, and I feel like the black spirit is a very entrepreneurial spirit. I feel like young black men, I'll, I'll give you one example. I'll give you one example. I know I'm going on a tangent, but let, let's take um, at a time like now, one of the things that comes up a lot when we talk about young black men is, is lawlessness, rebellion, disrespect for authority. And we always talk about that in a negative context, right? Like, you know, hey, maybe if these young black men learn how to respect authority, maybe if they learn how to be a little bit more well-behaved, uh, then they could have lived. Now, I do agree that out of self-interest, if you find yourself in a life-threatening situation, it behooves you to try to conduct yourself in a way that's gonna buy you more time, of course, right? If, if some thug is in my face with a gun, I'm gonna try to reason with him or talk with him in a way that keeps me alive right? That doesn't, that doesn't justify what the thug is doing. And it doesn't change the fact that no, I have no respect. Yeah, that's, that. that's like a strategic insight, right? Like, it's you a know, strategic somebody, insight. somebody who's looking to do you harm, uh, don't taunt him, and you'll have less likelihood of having harm done. That's not about the morality of the broader issue. 
exactly. And so I certainly do think it's important to, to educate people on, 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 on how to recognize when you can be at risk and how to make sure you, you, you strategically behave in a way that gets you out of that situation alive and unharmed. At the same time, I think there is something beautiful and anarchist about the spirit of Black people who question authority and, and, and who challenge this idea that we, we owe respect to political authority figures in a way that's different from the respect that they owe to us. And, 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 to you, me, mean, and you mean anarchist in the literal without rulers, like non, you know, voluntary, non-forced, non-governmental action. You don't mean anarchist in the go out and break people's windows and destroy property. I, I know what you mean, but I just want to clarify for those who don't. Yeah, when I say anarchy, I mean order without coercion. I mean rules without authoritarian rulers who assert that they have the privilege of violating moral laws that the rest of us are accountable to. I mean it in the rich political sense that has existed for years before the term was co-opted and hijacked by people who wore t-shirts with A's on them and ran around flipping over garbage cans and setting things on fire like that's ever what anarchy was about. No, that's chaos, that's discordianism, but that's not what political anarchy yeah, ever yeah. was, right? Um, th this is a very rich tradition. But, but, that, um, but that beauty that, that, and I'm with you, like I, I feel so frustrated when I see when I see these narratives that are like so close, but off, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. the people who are saying, stand with these protesters and whatever, they, there can be a dismissal of, uh, you know, stupidity and violence being done by protesters perhaps, but especially the, the people who are like, oh, we got to put an end to this. There's like a lumping in of any dissatisfaction or disobedience to so-called authority is bad and a threat. And it's like, no, that is truly, that is courage. That is heroism. That is entrepreneurship because authority is often, almost always the most dangerous thing. And it's the costliest thing to, to oppose because, you know, because it's in authority because it tends to be the dominant worldview and it tends to have, and so like just the idea that, oh, well, if the police say something or if something's a law, you should obey it. The yeah. default assumption, which is way stronger on black culture, that not necessarily, like, why should I? I need a better reason than it's the law. That is beautiful. That is, I wish that was more prevalent everywhere. And like, I, I hate people criticizing that because that spirit is just freaking awesome. We need more of that, you know? Give me a damn good reason before I change my behavior, instead of just saying, do it because I have a bigger gun than you, you know? Did you lose me or did I lose you? Hey man, looks like you froze. Could have been oh, I, fr I, I was probably in the middle of the, the greatest speech ever given. And uh, you know, no one will ever know if it, I don't know, it probably recorded, but that's it. Go ahead. Take the mic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny too, because some of this type of rebellious uh, sentiment is dismissed as unpatriotic. And to me, if you just want to focus on America and patriotism, I, I, think, I think skepticism of authority is one of the most patriotic American things that you can do. I mean, you look at the right to bear arms, that, that right to bear arms was initially valued, not because people feared leftist protesters coming to storm down their, their retail stores, right? Th that, that was specifically directed at government. Like, mm -hmm. we, we can't trust the state. We, we, we can't trust the government because even though we believe in this institution, like, you never know who's going to be in charge. We, we got to make sure that we keep them balanced out by having the right to bear arms. So, I mean, you look at the history of that. That's one thing. Another thing, too, I think people misunderstand authority. Like, authority just means that you are authorized to do certain things. Like, all authority is contextual. There's no such thing as a position you can occupy that gives you the right to make pronouncements about every aspect of a person's life. So if you are someone who has authority, the proper question to ask is, what exactly are you authorized to do? And what are the limitations of that? And whatever you're authorized to do, that's really a way of saying, these are your responsibilities to the people. And something really valuable has been lost when we fail to think and speak of police officers 
as our servants. That's what they're supposed to be. And, and, and when, when you start to look at that as disrespectful and say, oh, watch the way you're speaking, young man, like, like as if police, as if that's a form of disrespect. I mean, as entrepreneurs, we're servants to our customers. That's right. not disrespect. We're nothing without them. We no, if I'm like, them. you know, hey, uh, let's, let's hire somebody to, um, you know, to watch out for our neighborhood pool, right? Like we have here at our HOA. And to make sure that people who aren't with the neighborhood aren't like jumping over the fence and throwing beer cans in there or, you know, weirdos coming around or, and also to make sure nobody's drowning to, to help them, you know, be safe, whatever. If you hire that person to serve the neighborhood and if they started being like, pool's closed today, why? Because I said so, go back home. Don't talk to me that way. And then like, you know, attacking you and whatever, that person would get their ass handed to them. They'd be done. They wouldn't work there anymore. They could, and that's, that is the idea. Like policing is just a, a normal function that any community has. It's a kind of a combination of, you know, protection of property, security, as well as, you know, uh, if some injustice has been done, if, if it's possible to figure out who did it through some detective work or whatever else, that's another function. There's a kind of a couple different functions that probably should be separate, not all under one head, and certainly shouldn't all be, you know, monopolized like that. But the regardless of how they're done and how they're you know, the services are delivered, the attitude, the mindset of like deference to this, this person that serves in this role, as if no matter what, they deserve more respect than anyone else and less scrutiny is, is horrific. It's so horrific. I mean, that's the source ultimately of all of the abuses is, you know, people will tend to do what they can get away with and what they can get rewarded for in different contexts. And it's that incentive structure, which is, which is based on that fundamental belief, which is based on a, a deification of a service provider. It's just a service provider, a service you know? Provider. Right. Yeah. right. And, and to me, the essence of critical thinking is when you can embrace skepticism as a methodology, not as a form of antagonism, right? The, the fact that I approach what someone says from a, from a standpoint that demands evidence and, and, and gives, gives deference to no parties involved, that's th that, that shouldn't be a threat un un unless you're hiding something or un unless you intend to advance your point of view dishonestly. And when it comes to government, it's so important for all things that pertain to liberty that we learn how to embrace skepticism of everyone, including political authorities, including political officers, and including the people that, that we say are victims of police brutality. Yeah, we, we, I believe in the idea that we should say, let's gather all the facts, let's wait on the whole story. I just think that applies to everybody. Yeah. And, and, and it's very dangerous to become so attached to one group that you start to say things like, well, this group over here must have did something wrong if they ended up hurt or dead. The cop must have did something wrong if he ended up hurt or dead, or that guy that was interacting with the cops, he must have done something wrong if he ended up hurt or dead. Let's gather all the facts about everybody and let's embrace healthy skepticism of everyone. And, and sort of bring it back, to bring it back to this black dreams keep me up at night. I, I don't wanna spend the majority of my time having debates with people about, oh, but, but black guys are good, I promise you. That's, that's not where I wanna spend my, my time in life. I wanna spend my time actually with those black guys, even if no camera's on me, even, even if I'm not being praised as virtuous because of it, with those black guys that don't believe in themselves, with those black guys that struggle with mental illness, with those black guys that feel like they have anger and rage that they don't know what to do with, with those black guys who feel like power is located somewhere outside of themselves. And I wanna help build up their self-esteem. I wanna help build up their skill set so that they can be able to achieve the economic self-sufficiency that's necessary to feel free in the world they live in. You know, I, I've often said, it's not merely my interest to create a, a society in which every person feels free, but to create individuals who can figure out how to be free in any kind of society. And, and, and this is just a group that I feel the deepest empathy for. I'll, I'll, I'll share my gifts and talents with anybody that God brings to me. But in terms of like, mm, what fires me up, man, I'm going to help young brothers, man. Man, what I love so much about that, it, it's just so, it's so resonant with the philosophy that I have just gravitated more and more towards through life. Um, 
it's timeless. And what I mean by that is like, it doesn't require you to be correct about any given thing that's happening right now today in the world. And why that's more important than it's ever been is it's harder than it's ever been to be correct about anything going on in the world because there's so much chaos. So like, just look at the information. I was just browsing Twitter today, which is just like a, a, a shit show. And you see videos of police doing horrific things to people. And then you see some other people sharing clips from that same video that kind of make it look like the person who, you know, fell down and got hurt was actually play acting and they had people set up to get it on camera on purpose to make the police look worse than they were. And then you have other ones where police are doing really nice things. And then you have people showing that that was actually the police play acting, or you have someone breaking windows. And it turns out that was like a police guy trying to make the protesters look worse than they were. And so you have so many levels of like bad reporting, inaccurate reporting, deceptive reporting, and then bad actors, good actors, deceptive actors on all sides going on in all these cities, all the time, everything's so crazy. And so trying to do something that's specifically about, I want to be on the right side of history or help the winning group or pick the right policy to, that you end up either never having enough information to be for sure who's the good guy and who's the bad guy, or just picking one and then having being forced to turn on that bias and interpret every other piece of evidence as like a threat or a support versus what you're talking about is always relevant. It's like, look, I don't give a shit what they or they or they or they are or are not doing that's right or wrong. I want to talk about you. What are you facing? What are you struggling with? And what can you do for you? How can you take that locus of control back? And that's, I find that so much like just with my own life, with my kids, you know, my son is, is 15 now. And so he's more tuned into these things going on in the world and talking about it with the COVID lockdowns and whatever. And like, you know, asking me, well, what's happening? What's going to happen is, you know, well, what if I do this? Well, what happens if I, are we in danger of this and this? And like, you know, the world's more uncertain than it's ever been in my lifetime in, in this country anyway. Um, and I, you know, instead of feeling pressure, like I have to have all these answers as his dad, I just keep coming back to, I don't know, but like, what can you control in your own life? What can yeah. you do to be the kind of person you want to be? Whatever else may or may not happen to you, how can you set yourself up so that when shit goes down, you're the guy that people can lean on or that when shit goes down, it's not going to, it's less likely to go down because you're the person you need to be or whatever it is. Can you take that control and do something that if, if all this stuff blows over and it was all hyped up, you're still a better person because you were focusing on the right things. If things get worse and worse and worse and we're living in you know, apocalyptic World War III, you're still a better person because you were focusing on the right things. And there's something about yeah. in the moments when you're, most, when you're most enticed to put your entire self in the minute by minute changes, that's when being timeless and thinking about and focusing on timeless things is the most crucial, you know? Yeah, and, and, and that actually makes the pursuit of truth more, more fun Be, because now you can, you can still delve into the world of particulars and, and you can still check out all those little news reports and those fun, the, 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 I won't say fun, but those interesting provocative videos to watch. And, and, and you can afford to say, okay, so here's my theory of, of what I think is going down. And then if some video comes out the next day that completely uh, refutes your theory, you could be like, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting. All right, here's my upgraded theory. And, and there's no significant risk involved with you analyzing events, forming opinions, and upgrading your, your conclusions with, with more evidence. So, so it's interesting, you brought up the, 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 the guy who was breaking the windows, the auto zone. I, I brought him up just, just a few days ago. And, and so they had the video of it. You could see that the dude, I mean, he has all the markings of a provocateur for sure. And, and, and people are trying to get him out of there. And, and there was a, a, a tweet that said his ex-wife identified him as the specific person who was a police officer. Well, then just like you were talking about, a couple of days later, the local police was like, nope, it's not that guy. And I think they were able to substantiate that. Then other police in the area were like, we don't know who it is. And it turns out that this dude hasn't been identified. So 
now my upgraded theory is that this is someone who was a provocateur. We don't know who he was. We do know that the locals didn't want him there. He could just be like some weird dude that just came down there thinking that people would like it. He makes some friends. He could be some guy that's like, I'm gonna, you know, like make everything worse. We don't know, but we don't have to make, we don't have to be embarrassed by the fact that like, hey, I, yeah, I truly like, thought it was a cop, but like I'm not embarrassed that, that I was wrong. Yeah, when that information comes out, you can ask yourself, did I do anything that now turns out to have been a waste of time because of this new information? And yeah. it doesn't even have to be embarrassing or bad, but just a waste of time. And if the answer is, yeah, you wasted a lot of time now that this turns out to be this instead of this, well, then rethink what's your focus. Can I, what can I do that won't be a waste of time no matter what new facts come out, you know? Um, I think that's I like, I like really, that. really important. Like if it turns out that this entire thing is like HG Wells war of the worlds and it was, it was all pretend and it was all just, uh, you know, done in a stage and we were all just being duped and nothing actually happened anywhere. Will I have wasted my time with what I'm doing? Uh, or if this turns out to be way worse than it was. Right. I think that's a, just an important question. Cause again, like you said, like you can tune in and, and for me, I hate the news. I hate knowing what's going on in current events. But for the first time in my lifetime, I feel like in order to be sort of responsible with my kids and my family, not like a responsible citizen to go vote or some useless thing like that, but responsible with my kids and my family planning for our own safety and, and well-being, I do have to pay a little bit of attention to what's going on in the world because I don't want to all of a sudden wake up and have there be tanks in my streets and not know why and not know who they're after and do something that endangers my family. Like that's yeah. crazy that we're at this place, but we are. So paying attention, even using it as an entry point for conversations for all, you know, it's relevant getting the information, but, but never investing your time in something that will become useless. If new facts emerge that change the, the, you know, the spin on the situation. Yeah, you know, so related to that, I was having a conversation with somebody who was saying that that all the people that that are doing the looting, that um that that, that it's people on the left, and I was just like, I don't know who's out there, right? I mean, everybody out there has masks, and I don't know, and and I wasn't defending the left. I I, I nothing changes for me if if we were able to establish empirically that every single person out there looting was on the left, like. There's nothing in my universe that changes. <laughs> I don't lose anything. But because I'm just skeptical, everybody's out there with masks. There are a ton of people. I don't know who's out there. But what I do know is when stuff like that happens, they're always opportunists. And, and, and there can be opportunists in every political demographic, evil people in every demographic. And so I, I expressed that. And this person came back like, no, like it's all people on the left. And, and one of the things that made me realize is I never want to be at you know at a point in, in in my thinking where i need i need something to not be true in terms of who did it where i can't afford for the person who committed that murder to be black or i lose everything my philosophy falls apart where i can't afford for that uh for that person who did that really horrific thing to be you know a voluntarius or something like that you you want to be free enough to say whatever the truth is I have situated my worldview to be flexible enough to not merely accommodate it, but to take it in and ground myself upon it, you know? And, and I think there's something so important about being able to analyze the validity of ideas and ideologies and analyze the validity or justice or injustice of actions as separate types of analysis. So for example, I have no problem discussing and analyzing Marxism and saying wholeheartedly or wholeheadedly, I guess, that I think Marxism is an is a incoherent, uh, bad ideology. I think it's a bad philosophy, and I think the attempts to implement it lead to bad outcomes. And then I can also say that I'm sure there are Marxists out there who are doing kindnesses right now, who are helping shopkeepers or giving water to people or protesting peacefully for good reasons, and, and vice versa. There's probably some fascist asshole who like saved a puppy, uh, you know, and, and, and there's probably some libertarian free market person who like went in and stole some shit opportunistically somewhere. And like, I don't have to defend anybody's actions and call a bad action bad and a good action good. And I also don't have to say, and see, 
that makes this ideology tainted or this ideology better. Like, I don't get, you know, that, I think that's just so dangerous to fall into. I saw somebody share like a, some like undercover video of somebody like going to an Antifa meeting and they were talking about how they were going to do violence to people and whatever. And somebody shared it and like, oh, this is terrible. And then the, the first comment, the person was like, Oh, well, the guy who's, uh, was it, Project Veritas, it is. It's this, it's this dude who does all these undercover things. He's like kind of a like crazy, high-risk guy. He always goes in and gets this undercover footage. I don't know anything about the guy. I've just seen some of this stuff. And the first comment was like, why would you share anything by that guy? Here's an article about why he's a bad person. And I'm like, well, okay, that's a totally separate topic to whether or not whatever this Antifa group is talking about is a good or bad thing. Like, why do these things have to, like, are we only allowed to, you know, share things from people who have never done anything bad or, you know, it just, I think the ability to separate ideology from action is important. And of course I get it. I get why you would want to see the connection between them because yeah. that's where you say, Hey, this ideology I think is wrong. And I think if people try to implement it, it will lead to terrible actions. And then when you see those terrible actions, you want to say, see, I told you so it's because of this ideology, but being able to see the connection between bad ideas and bad outcomes is different from being incapable of analyzing individual actions and ideology as two separate things. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. It, it reminds me of those early um, Christian apologetics debates about um, who's done, who's like done the most killings, atheists or Christians. <laughs> <laughs> and, and both sides would treat this debate like, Hey man, if atheists have killed fewer people than Christians, atheism is true, you know, or, or like the Christians who felt like, Oh man, we got to make sure that the numbers on the Christian side, the number of murders committed by Christians and it's, I can see why people are interested in it, but it always seems so silly to me to like, you know, huff and puff over making sure that I'm, you know, analyzing statistics, always up, updating the, the information to make sure that, you know, oh man, in order for my position to be true, like we need fewer evils done by the Christians. It's like, no, the, the truth exists independently of the behavior of all of those who claim to represent it, you know? And, and mm. when you can separate that, it, it just allows you to think so much more clearly. And that's a good line. The truth exists independently of all those who claim to, to believe that. That's really good. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about TK. I think we even talked about it on my, my podcast a couple of days, several years ago, but several years ago, you, you had a, a shitty encounter with police where you got basically pulled over for no reason and harassed yeah. and whatever. Yeah. And, you know, you, for the first time, because you'd never shared stuff like that ever before, you'd had experiences, you know, all throughout your life, especially growing up in a, in a sort of a mostly white neighborhood and stuff, you and your brothers, I know you had all kinds of shitty experiences, but for the first time you kind of decided you were just going to share it. So you just share it in a Facebook post and then uh, Fee took it and published it as an article and, and it got all this attention. It got picked up by Newsweek. You, know, you got hate mail, you got love mail, all this stuff. And I remember that was like a really tough thing for you. Like you were like, okay, you got this, you know, 15 minutes of fame, but it was kind of an, for all the wrong reasons, not the things you wanted to be known for, not the things you were working on. And, and I think you worked, worked with it, made the most of it. And it wasn't like, you know, whole, you know, life destroying, but I remember that was a not a pleasant experience. It was something you didn't want. And now fast forward to today where you're, you, you know, you're like, Hey, like, I want to be the guy who talks about race. I want, you know, I'm your token. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, that's a, that'd be a great marketing slogan though. Hey, hire me. I'll be your token black guy. Like, I don't care what your reason is. I want to come talk about what I want to talk about. Um, no, but just the. Everybody, the, everybody in crypto right now just thinks you're talking about like me tokenizing my identity on the blockchain. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're going you're gonna <laughs> to do an ICO. An ICO. Um, but like, that transition where now you're like, yeah, I want to talk about race. Yeah, I want to jump into these conversations. Yeah, I'm not afraid of it. Um, how has that shift happened? And are you, are you at all like awkward as you like enter this phase where you're much more open to talking about things specifically framed in racial terms? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so first I'm gonna give you a teaser line uh, referencing basketball so we can, as, as, as usual, lose everybody that's listening to us with sports yeah. analogies. But it's all about my transformation from Isaiah Thomas to Bill Lambeer. Oh, this is great. I'm already <laughs> hooked. I'm already hooked. 
<laughs> I made the decision to take the leap from being Isaiah Thomas to Bill Embiid. So to, to use this as an example, um, th there's a documentary called The Last, um, not, no, there's a documentary called 30 for 30, The Bad Boys. There are a lot of ESPN 30 for 30 documentaries, but one of my favorite ones, The Detroit Bad Boys. And um, this was a team that before they were called The Bad Boys, they, they were hated all around the league because they were just a bunch of scrappers. They were a bunch of blue collar construction workers who happened to end up on a basketball team. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, but none of those guys from Dennis Rodman to Bill Lambeer, none of them had the, the outer trappings of players like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, players that you look at, you say they're supposed to be good at basketball. They were just hard workers and they just played together and did what it takes to win. And the foundation for that team was Isaiah Thomas. And he was the guy who I think Isaiah had a, a higher upside than everyone on that team, not only in terms of talent, but also in terms of charisma. If there's anybody on that team that could have easily run for senator, mayor, or something like that, Isaiah's the guy because he's got an aura about him. You just want to like him. You know, he's got a smile that lights up the room. He's got a sense of sincerity about him that just makes him a very likable person. And guys like Bill Lambeer and Dennis Rodman, they, they didn't even have that upside to work with. So, so th their challenge was different from his. And when, when he joined that team, you know, he kind of got pulled along with the bad boys narrative. And, and it was never really clear if he wanted that or not. The other guys had to embrace it because they were seen as, as bullies, as dirty players. And, and they it, already, it was their only option, right? It's like it either a, I'd be a forgettable player or a player that's called a villain. And, you know, who, like, what, what am I going to do? Yeah, and there's this pivotal moment in, in the, the documentary where the guys just basically band together and they're like, you know what? If everybody hates us, we're going to own it. We're going to own it. We're going to go all the way with it. We're going to call ourselves the bad boys. We're going to embrace the, the villain thing. And – you always got the impression with Isaiah that, you know, those were his boys and it was important to him that he fit in. And so he went along with it, but he always seemed to be kind of unsure, you know, because it, it's, it's like he wanted to be liked and he was accustomed to being liked before the Pistons. He was the darling. And at the same time, it's like, you've got this bad boy thing that you're associating with these guys. And, and there, and, and there are so many moments, even to this day where you can see in interviews, like, He's conflicted. He never throws his bad boys under the bus. And he says, oh, no, we did the right thing. We were, we were fine. We had a, but he's like, but, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to cause any harm. Or I didn't know. Was, he, like, still wants to be loved and wants you to know that he's more than a bad boy, but he's not going to deny it because he doesn't want to be, you know, throw his guys. Whereas, like, Bill Lambert will just be like, no, we hated him. Yeah, we treated him like crap. I don't care. They can hate my he's guts like for the rest of my life. I got two championship rings, you know? <laughs> Like, he's completely at unity with his identity, you know? Exactly. So, so here's the pivotal moment in, in, in the documentary that, uh, and, and I'll map it back over to, to my thing. So there's a moment where the, the Pistons lose a game to the Celtics. Larry Bird just lights them up like he always did. And Dennis Rodman makes a comment after the game that if Larry Bird was a black player, he would just be talked about like an ordinary dude. But basically, it's only because he's white that everybody goes crazy over him. So they come to Isaiah Thomas and ask him what he thinks. And he even seemed to be less comfortable than Rodman as he's talking about it. But, but he says he's got to agree with De Dennis Rodman. And all hell breaks loose when Isaiah, you know, says he agrees with Rodman. They even have this press conference where Larry Bird just joins Isaiah to kind of like try to make it easier on him, let the world know I'm not mad at him. He was just upset. It wasn't a big deal. But Isaiah Thomas ruins it. The whole world is there. They're, they're waiting to hear what Isaiah Thomas has to say. And, 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 and he's got two options that can easily make this go away. He can do a Bill Lambert or a Dennis Rodman and just be like, yeah, I said it. If he was a black dude, he'd just be talked about like an ordinary person. You got a problem with it? Beat me on the court. I'm out of here. If, if that would have happened, nobody would have really cared. They would have gotten mad for a week and forgot about it. Or he could have been like, you know what? Look, the guy just got through lighting us up for 37 points. I was livid because we lost. Everybody knows that's one of the baddest players on the planet. Nobody can stop Larry Bird. I was just upset that we lost. This, this whole conversation is stupid. No I, I'm, you know, no, I don't think that he, you know, it would be treated the same or treated worse if he was black. But what he did was he behaved like a man that was really uncomfortable with himself 
and more specifically like a man who didn't know how to manage the experience of, of having people mad at him. So he, he just starts rambling. He's like, you know, all of a sudden I'm racist. I have one moment and all of a sudden I'm racist. And you know, I've subsequently looked up the term racist and you know what it means? And it was just really Yeah, awkward. when he talked about looking up the term in the dictionary, it's like, he just, <laughs> he couldn't decide. He just, he wanted to, to not back down to make his team look bad, but to yeah. not be thought of as somebody who said something offensive and like you just he couldn't he couldn't get it he couldn't get it out. Yeah, the only person that talks like that is a is a man whose feelings are hurt because he sees himself as good and he resents the world for not recognizing that he's a good guy. And and, and it was really a way of saying, guys, I've tried my whole life. I've tried very hard to do the right thing. I've tried to be respectful to people. I've tried to be nice and kind and diplomatic. And, and I make one mistake and you can't see past that enough to know that I'm a good guy. And that's what hurt him. That's what that was about for him. Um, and and my, my wife watched this with me. And it was funny because she was laughing at the fact that back then and up to this day, nobody cares at all about the original guy who started it. And that was Dennis Rodman. Like yeah. no, nobody cares that Dennis Rodman was the guy that made the comment. No, nobody, nobody calls him a racist for saying that comment. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like nobody's even interested in him. It's like, oh, that's just Rodman being Rodman. Nobody's mad at him. <laughs> but it shows the difference between a guy who's just willing to own who he is and doesn't need everybody to like him versus a guy that's psychologically dependent on everybody thinking, oh, he's a good guy. And so that was my, that was my no more Mr. Nice Guy moment. I, I told that story, and as I was telling it, if I'm being honest with myself, I thought I was being a good guy. I, I was trying to, to show people who were hurting over this that I related, that I've been through things like that too. And I was also trying to show people in a very diplomatic way who were un, insensitive to this that there's more to it than just like people being criminals or being disrespectful. I, I, thought, I, was, I thought I was doing a good thing. And, and I in injected myself into a discussion that was more politicized than I realized because I hadn't been, been participating in a lot of those discussions. And I had people accusing me of lying. I had people you know, accusing me of, of, of like inciting race wars. I have people telling me I'm part of the problem. You have people saying, claiming that your bad. wife wasn't a real person, that you made her up. <laughs> yeah, man. And, and it's crazy for me to think of it this way now. But when I look back, that, that, that had to be the most traumatic experience of my life in the sense of how I handled it. Mm. You know, like I felt so scared. I felt so hurt. And I felt so alone because I felt like nobody really understood Everybody was like, man, forget about that dude. Man, forget about those people saying stuff about you. But it was so traumatic for me because up until that point, I was like in Isaiah Thomas mode where for the most part, everybody liked me. You know, like I, I, I didn't grow up like Bill and or Dennis Rodman where lots of people thought I was a jerk or nobody thought of me as a jerk. I, I've always been nice to everybody. I've always been a good guy. And, and I didn't realize how addicted I became to that good feeling that comes from people being like, man, he's a nice guy. He's a good dude. I like that guy. That can be very addicting. And that was a situation that forced me to sever that connection that I had with being a good guy. And I had to make a choice that I want to run back to my safe space of talking about things that are, are exclusively inspiring so that everybody can think I'm a good, good guy. Or do I wanna lean in to my truth and say, all right, I'm okay with making some people uncomfortable. I'm okay with some people thinking that I'm evil for talking about this. I'm not here to be liked by everyone. I'm here to be liked by myself and I'm gonna embrace the dark side. And it took some time and it wasn't an overnight thing. It was a process of many other experiences coming after that. But the guy that I am on the other side is a guy that has no concerns whatsoever with being nice or being thought of as nice. I simply wish to be good in accordance with my own principles, priorities, and preferences. If you think I'm good, good for you because that will make you feel better. If you don't think I'm good, it doesn't mean anything to me at all. All that matters is that I live in accordance with the philosophy of life that I espouse and I'm fully prepared and fully happy to ruin any and everybody's day 
in order to create the results that matter most to me based on the calling that I have in my life. I don't care if I ruin your day. I'm not here to leave you undisturbed. I'm here to be me. You know, it's funny. I was just thinking there's that. So there's the sort of level one. I want everybody to like me. And that's a torturous existence. And then level two, I don't give a shit. And then there's like a third level, which I think is equally as dangerous as level one, which is because like some people really are a nice guy. They want everyone to like them and everyone does. And that's actually consistent with who they are. It's not yeah. you know, out of the norm, but if it's not consistent, that's going to be torturous. But there's this third level that's like, no, I actually want everyone to hate me, which is like a <laughs> professional troll. Right. And, and there are people for yeah. whom that fits like a glove and they're perfectly yeah. comfortable. They love it. They're happy there. But there are other people who are like, yeah, I'm going to like, as a reaction about being hurt from being disliked, I, I want you to hate me. And you can tell that they're not enjoying it. They're trying to be like, <laughs> he just gets people to hate him. But it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I, I do want to say one more thing about the nice guy though, about, about the idea that some people are, are naturally that way. So I think you and I both would agree that, just in terms of like natural disposition that without even trying to be so I'm, I'm more of like a, a, a charitable a diplomatic type of person. Even if somebody say something that's just crazy and off the wall, it's just natural for me to be like, Hmm, I wonder what he meant by that. Like, yeah, he could have insulted me, but he might've missed something else. I might've misunderstood him. Like I just don't get mad really easily. When I do get mad, I get mad, but I don't just get mad over everything. And, and, when and I you naturally tend to make people just, just by the, your nature, not that you're trying to necessarily, people tend to feel good about themselves in their interactions with you because you have like, because you're curious about them in a genuine way. So it is, it is most likely someone who interacts with you is going to walk away thinking, I like that guy. That's a nice guy, you know? Yeah. And I like people not because I feel guilty about not liking them, not because I feel like God demands me to like people. I, I'm just really interested in people. But I think there's a difference between being that and being someone who uses forced niceness as a negotiation tool, right? Sometimes the nice guy is the one that ends up being the most bitter and resentful because, <laughs> because being nice for them means I'm going to pretend to like something that I don't really like as a way of avoiding conflict. And that way I'll be happy. And when people don't express gratitude for that, or when people don't reciprocate, those same people end up feeling bitter and used and upset. And so when I say no, no, Mr. Nice Guy stuff, there's a book with that title, by the way, for anybody that struggles with that. I, I think that's the thing that has to be condemned. Like if, if you're going to be nice, like if you're going to agree with somebody, agree because you agree with them, don't, you know, but like, don't, don't, don't make it a, don't make a living out of laughing at a bunch of jokes that you don't like that ain't even funny to you because you're afraid of what people are going to think of you. If you're the only plain face guy in the room, it's okay not to laugh at a joke. Is that why you just, I haven't had much time to talk to me lately because you don't want to pretend to laugh at my jokes anymore. Come Is that on. why I had to get on a podcast just to chat with you. <laughs> We're going to turn this into like a confrontation. Like, Hey, <laughs> Hey, how come you didn't return my call? <laughs> Hey, man, I feel like we got so, like, man, we, we missed the whole last dance. There was a lot of good stuff in there, but I, 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 don't, want, I don't want to control us. Like, what, what, did you, what did you want to talk about? No, no, I, I, I would love to chat about that a bit. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, just, just back on the, the topic at hand, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the topic of the day, <clears throat> the police brutality and the, you know, Black Lives Matter and all these protests and things like that going on. You are... You are a, an optimistic person, um, but you're not naive. You're also a realistic person. I'm curious, when you look at what's happening in the world right now, do you say, oh, this is a good sign. Good shit is happening. I like this. This is, this is some needed change is coming. Or do you say, shit, man, I'm a little uncomfortable about what's going on. I don't know if I like the direction that the world is headed. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I think... <sighs> At all times, both of those things are true, right? And you you have to decide not. So like, wanna... What is this like? Is some like Zen Buddhist thing or something? <laughs> <laughs> you can't give me an answer like that. TK, is the business failing or succeeding? It is doing both. <laughs> it's Schrodinger's business. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. I'll let you. I'll let you continue. You just. 
Yeah, I just wanted you so bad to pick one, and I knew deep down that you weren't going to give me that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it to you just in a, in a roundabout way. Okay, all right. So I think at all times, both things are true. There, there are always very grave, concerning things to be you know, worried about. And there are always some opportunities to be hopeful about. And the thing that you've got to decide is not necessarily which one I'm going to focus on in some like purely positive thinking self-help sense, but you got to decide which one are you going to use your actions to help make the bigger force, right? So there are things that, that, that are, are worrisome. There are, there are opportunities and possibilities that can give hope. And there's a battle between those two things. And I, I choose at all times to lend myself to the force of possibility, to the side of hope, not because I want to turn a blind eye to the stuff that's, that's worrisome, but because I want to make th what's going on over here bigger and stronger and more powerful. So I lend my voice to that. I speak about the challenges, but from within the context of, yo, for those who are builders, for those who are strategists and creators, here are some ways that we can use these challenges as opportunities to make something awesome happen. But yeah, when I look at when I look out the world, make no doubt about it. There's a lot of straight up manipulation and misinformation going on. I I am not naive to that at all. I mean, I think there's a lot of flat out lying by very powerful, influential, and vast networks that are producing or sowing the seeds of confusion and making it exceptionally difficult for people to even know what the truth is. And I believe there are agendas that are bigger than, than the, the obvious agendas, you know? And, and I believe there are forces that even where conflict is real, there are forces that will try to fuel the fire and manipulate the conflict in order to exaggerate it beyond what the individuals involved would be naturally incentivized to do. I believe a whole lot of that is going on. I believe it's very troublesome. I don't think there are any guarantees. Our nation could end up in a very bad place and we are seeing a lot of the writing on the wall that says, man, we're headed in some directions that we need to be concerned about. But at the same time, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? I've never been one of those types of guys to just go commenting on everybody's YouTube channels about you know, how the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, like, <laughs> I, want, I, I gotta do something, man, right? So yeah. I'm gonna use my voice, I'm gonna use my talents, I'm gonna use my business, I'm gonna use my connections to just try to focus on one thing I can do that can help give the, the side of freedom a little bit of extra fuel, a little bit of extra food. And if you come talking smack to me about, oh, but that won't make a difference, you know, it's like, okay, so what do you want me to do? You want me to not work at all? You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's almost like if I'm broke and somebody gives me $20, I'm not going to be like, yeah, but that's not $200. <laughs> it's a long way from zero. It's a Some long way from might zero, actually man. Say that. <laughs> So people actually say, I've just never been that type of two. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And it, you know, it's funny. You said like just the confusion, the misinformation, whatever. It's kind of like, um, you know, we've talked in the past about how we both have like a, like a entertainment, a, a love of conspiracy theory as like a yeah. consumption good. It's so fascinating. Yeah. It's fun. It's entertaining. Yeah. It's gotten to the point where like, if you're not at least a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, then you're like not paying any, like you, you, there's no option but to be a conspiracy theorist anymore because there's like such mm -hmm. conflict among all sources of information that someone somewhere is deliberately not telling the truth for some reason. And it's like, you know, you, you can't just look at things at face value anymore. There is no face value. There's like multiple face values that are all conflicting. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Help me out. I get my secret societies and my, my, my various organizations mixed up, but, but the term conspiracy theory that was coined by, um, that was by the CIA coined that after the JFK assassination. And there's like yeah. memos that you can see in a deliberate attempt to try to discredit anyone who was asking questions about that event. Yep. Uh, so yeah, they kind of created that, that phrase. Yeah, so, so the term conspiracy theory itself has conspiratorial origins, which is <laughs> a of ironies. But you, you know, it, it's kind of funny, man, that a whole bunch of prefaces, prefaces and qualifying remarks have to be issued by people who acknowledge the existence of conspiracy. Like a, a conspiracy theory is simply an assertion that the mainstream narrative being presented to us as an explanatory account of what's going on 
that it's it's not as it appears and that there are hidden agendas now and that there there are, and that there are people who are glad that you don't know you know who are glad that you think it is how it appears instead of how it really is to that, you know, whatever, as simple as that is. There are people that are glad you don't know what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Now l- let's take the word conspiracy theory and all of the negative connotations attached to it, put that on the shelf and let's just take, let's replace it with hidden agenda. This is something that we all knew to be a reality that we're going to have to deal with back when we were on the playground. It's elementary school kids right? Let, let's say there's a new kid at school and there are five really popular kids at the school and they don't like that new kid because that new kid's like a threat or something like that. And so they spread like lies about the new kid because they're afraid that new kid's going to be more popular than them, whatever. And the new kid doesn't know what's going on. New kid doesn't know why nobody likes them. The new kid just thinks that its challenges in life are naturally occurring when in reality, there are other people that are kind of manipulating their experience a little bit by spreading misinformation that's human nature. That's something that we do. We divide ourselves into groups, into factions, into organizations. And sometimes we lie. We spread misinformation in order to keep some people insufficiently informed so that they can't compete with us. I, I don't see why we believe that there are certain groups that are not vulnerable to that as a temptation. I'm not sure why anyone would think that just because it's the FBI or the CIA or the US government or any other government or the Republican party or the Libertarian party or whatever, or the, the, the Democratic party, that somehow this is the organization that wouldn't have anyone who would be highly incentivized to cover up the truth about something. I just don't even get why that's considered to be this fringe kind of thing. <laughs> um, all right. We, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the last dance a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you always have some, you always come away from watching things with some insight that nobody else pulls away or some, some part of the story will, will illustrate some deep philo- philosophical, you know, point for you or precept that nobody else caught. So oh, I want to know, apart from the sort of surface level, obvious stuff, Walking away from the last dance, what did that do for you? What did you pull away that you think is probably unique to you? That being the alpha of my own life is always a choice. And there is never a moment where a Phil Jackson can choose a Tony Kukoc over me. I am always the guy who gets to decide if I take that last shot. I'm always the guy who gets to decide if I take the big shot. And I, can, and I can either pout because another person didn't pick me to be the man, or I can step up and be honest with myself about the responsibilities that are involved with being the man, and I can step into it, realizing that I always have the permission to do it. That's a deeply personal one for me. That I man, so that's got a lot of layers to it because Scottie Pippen is – such a phenomenal player, such a phenomenal yeah. teammate, you know, it's, yeah. you know, great mindset, all this stuff. And yet the season when Jordan leaves, he plays a great season. But in that moment when there's a, a game winning shot, for some reason, Phil Jackson wanted to give the ball to Tony Kukoc instead of, instead of Pippen. And, and the for, play worked. That's the worst part, that it worked. Well, I know, that, and it worked. And, and Kukoc made the shot, right? <laughs> With Pippen sitting out because he was so mad. Um, you know, and, and all the focus tends to be on the fact that Pippen sat out and refused to play and what that did to the team and all that stuff. But I think you're getting at a much more interesting insight, which is why did it get to that point in the first place? Because we all know... Yeah. Phil Jackson never would have done that to MJ. The times never. when the times where Kerr or Paxson hit a big shot, it's because Michael decided I'm triple teamed. I'm choosing to pass it. You be ready in case I make up that, in case I change my mind and I want you to shoot it. You know, right. Phil would never get them in the huddle and say, okay, MJ, we're going to have uh Kukoc take this one, right? <laughs> Why? What's the no difference right. yeah. that would cause Phil to even have that thought when Scotty's involved and not with Mike? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I think that's right on the money. I'm just going to go a little bit more fundamental than that. 
<laughs> you see, really, it was the minute he chose his jersey number and in the in the tenth grade. No, go ahead. So every man has his own path to greatness, right? So Michael Jordan's path ain't the same as Kobe's path, ain't the same as you know Kawhi's path. Everybody, every man has his own path, and, and that path looks differently you know, in terms of when choice points arise and, and what those choice points look like. But rather than looking at this as a moment where Scotty wasn't picked or where Scotty was vibrating at a frequency that caused people to not look at him as a leader, I look at that as the moment where Scotty made his choice. Let me give you an analogy that's related to this. In that same documentary, they talked about when the Bulls were playing against the Seattle, uh, against Seattle in the finals. And George Carl knew that Gary Payton was his best defender, but Gary Payton was kind of struggling with an injury. And so he didn't want him guarding Jordan. And he persisted in that all the way until game four. And at one point, Gary Payton told his coach, I don't care what you say, I'm guarding Jordan, right? And even though, Oh, Gary Payton might have overestimated how good of a job he did guarding Jordan. Nobody. By, by the way, that was one of the best moments in the entire series is when Jordan watches, <laughs> watches the video of Gary Payton talking about how he was going to, you know, how he locked him up and whatever. And the look on Jordan's face as he's laughing. <laughs> that's, a, that's such a great moment. And, and the memes following that were so great. But, but you, you notice how there was no controversy over Gary Payton telling his coach, I don't care what you say. I'm guarding Michael Jordan because he went out there and did it. People look at that as like, that's what leaders do. That's what ballers do. And, and while I don't believe Phil Jackson would have ever done that to Jordan, I don't believe that Jordan would have ever taken that if Phil had tried to do it. So, so he, here's what I, here's why I think it was a choice point for Scotty. When Phil Jackson says, I'm going to run the play for cool coach. Scotty could do. Scotty could do a couple of things. He could do three things. Actually. One is he could sit there and argue with Phil and be like, no, I'm taking a shot. I don't care what you say and see where that gets him. Two, he could threaten Ku coach like Jordan did to his teammates. He could say, Ku coach, I will kill you if you don't give me the ball. Look at me in the eye. I will kill you if you don't give me the ball, right? And Ku coach probably would have gave it to him. Or he could have been like, no problem, Phil. I'll do exactly what you say, lie through his teeth, and then get the ball and decide that he's going to shoot the shot. Now, if Scotty hits that shot, we are talking about an entirely different na narrative for him. If Scotty hits that shot, there is nobody on the planet who's going to be like, oh, that was the wrong move. Like Bill Cartwright doesn't give him that demoralizing, condescending, why is this grown man talking to me like this speech, right? I mean, man, when Bill Cartwright is giving you that talk, <laughs> like that, that's it. Like you don't get to be alpha no more. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Your men on, are man. already dead. <laughs> Yeah, right. You can't ever be in a situation where Bill Cartwright's telling you how to be great. Like you led the Bulls in like every statistical category. You were the all-star game MVP and Bill Cartwright's talking to you like this, bro. That that cannot happen. If Scotty hits that shot, then he's a legend. We're, we're telling that story the same way that we tell Michael Jordan's egotistical stories. It wasn't that he that he had ego. Michael Jordan had the biggest ego, but he owned it and he worked. And so what I took away from that is like, there are moments where it looks like somebody else is picking your fate, but you always have more options than what might seem obvious in the moment. And to me, the fact that Scotty chose to pout, that he chose to sit on the game, remove himself from the situation as an act of protest because my feelings are hurt and I'm mad. To me, that's a way of saying, I know that I could just go take the ball and shoot it myself but that's really dangerous. And if I miss the shot, I'm going to look really bad. Yep. And so I would rather put the responsibility on someone else to be. Yeah, it's, it's like saying, I really want the shot, but I'm only willing to do it if you guys all publicly back me. That's it. That's and it. then if you all publicly back me, that way if I miss, that's you it. all wanted me to anyway. Uh, so you're not publicly backing me, so I'm gonna pout and I'm gonna I'm gonna go out here. That's that's a really yeah, that's a really good insight. That's it. Yeah. That's a really good insight. Man, that series, I'm like, I, I already I recorded them all. I already gotta watch them again. I'm having withdrawal symptoms, you know. Hey, I, I got a game for you to go watch. Um 
I, I've got to get the date right, but it's it's the it's the Bulls' seventy-two win season. Go watch the game against the Denver Nuggets, the first game in Denver, where you had Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, who was who was uh, yeah, Steph yeah. before Steph, and go watch. Uh, Is that the, the one they lost? That's the one they lost. Yeah, but but the Denver Nuggets were beating them by like thirty-two points at halftime, and. I remember watching that game live at this point. The Bulls had only lost maybe about like three or four games. And it, it was a championship atmosphere because everybody wanted to beat them. And the way the Bulls came back, even though they like gassed out coming back to the point where they lost, after I watched that game, that's when I was like, I am watching a special team. I've seen comebacks before, but there was something magical about the way they came back, the determination and the, the, just the finesse and the aesthetics behind it you're like, wow, this is a truly great team. They can and, win whatever they want. Uh, I'm going to have to go look that game up because this is something that I've appreciated so much during this Warriors run over the last, you know, five years. I've watched as many games as I can possibly watch. And for a reason, like even regular season, which I normally don't care that much about NBA regular season because most guys don't seem to, to care that much either. So if they don't care, why should I care? The players <laughs> themselves. Um, right. But watching them, it's like just looking at a win-loss column, being like, oh, they beat this team, big deal. Oh, they beat this team. Oh, yeah, they were supposed to win this game. Or, oh, they lost. Yep. It doesn't tell you anything. That's when I knew this team was great, when I started seeing the way that they won or even the way that they lost. To see how a momentum shift goes like this and you're down by 20 and the other team is on fire and whatever, and to see no, not being at all – bothered by that and to just slowly come back in and when the other team gives you an, and like you see the way it happens and that's when you can see greatness and that's what gives you the predictive power to be like okay I know this team is now ready to make a deep playoff run because there's just something different that you need mentality wise and like watching those moments watching the emotional swings how do people handle runs in either direction when somebody's yes. running them or when they're running somebody else and I remember with the the Pistons sort of bad boys number two team, the one that, that beat the Lakers in that, in that championship and had that, that you know, series of um, several years in a row where they were the Eastern Conference champs. There were so many games where what they did, it almost never, with a rare exception, they would occasionally catch fire on offense and like Rip Hamilton and Chauncey, they would just start hitting shots and be like, oh, these guys are on fire, this feels great. But most of their victories, they did not win. They right. just refused to lose. And the other team, they would just put them in a, in a span of eight minutes where they didn't score for an entire eight-minute stretch and had this defensive lockdown. And you would just see the other team lose mentally because of that. They were like, <laughs> we just can't get an inch. We lose. And then the Pistons would, like, win by default. They, like, almost never felt like they were – and just watching them take a team's – Heart from them take a team's ability even when they're playing those Lakers like the way that Carl Malone and and uh, Gary Payton and it, these guys just became an embarrassment because the Pistons had done something to them they had found some weakness maybe in the team culture and chemistry maybe in the fabric there was other things in the locker room and they just like probed it and probed it and probed it until it just cracked and there was just nothing left there uh, and just watching the teams who <laughs> Where that, you know, when that happens and the teams who don't let that happen to them, even if they lose, they don't fall apart, you know? Dude, those Pistons were so stressful. It's so demoralizing when, when a team is beating you by one point, they miss 16 shots in a row, <laughs> and then they're beating you by three points. <laughs> it's so demoralizing. It's truly, truly incredible. Like, for that team, like, like a five-point lead was basically game over, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Hey, you know, it, it's an interesting observation how you can, you can know greatness by watching the way teams lose. Mm -hmm. um, this reminds me of those old Duke teams with like Grant Hill and Christian Leitner. Those guys almost never lost. But when they lost, it would always be the other team played a historically great game, right? And, and you, would, you would just leave, if you hated Duke like I did, you would just leave feeling so depressed because yeah. you know that when it counts, that's never going to happen again. <laughs> it's like the, the New England Patriots. Like, and football has, I think, a lot more 
game to game luck and variability. Well, maybe not, but it, it seems, it seems like it. Cause it, you know, in basketball, you have so many possessions, so many opportunities to score over a longer period of all those possessions. It's less likely that, you know, something will be completely flukish, but football really can. So you can have a crazy game where a, a terrible team beats a good team, but the Patriots, they always have, you know, they always lose a handful of games, but they're usually just hard fought, boring games that they lose. But they, it feels like they always have one game every season where they get destroyed by some team that's not very good. And that team is just flying high and everybody's like, oh, the Patriots, are they falling apart? Oh, blah, blah. And the, the post-game press conferences are the greatest thing ever. You just go, you turn on Bill Belichick and it's like, it's so demoralizing if you're a fan of the other team or you don't like the Patriots because they're just like, Bill, what happened? How did you guys lose by 30 points? Everything fell apart. You said you were focused on stopping their running game, and yet they ran for a season-high 250 yards tonight. We're on to Cincinnati. <laughs> every, every question, they're ta- he's talking about next week's game. We're on to Cincinnati. He's like, yeah, they played a good game. We, uh, <laughs> we lost. We're on to Cincinnati. And it's like – he literally doesn't care. He's thinking about the next game. And that's when you see, like, this team's culture, you can't just beat them like that. You can't beat them with trash talk. You can't beat them with flukes. You can't, you're not going to destroy them. They're not going to fall apart. Whereas other teams that are hyped and they're supposed to be really good, they get blown out. They have a press conference afterwards where they're all losing it. They're fighting with each other. It's, you know, you just know it's not going to happen. I remember when uh, the Kobe Shaq Lakers three-peat team, when, when they brought Phil Jackson, because they, they were having trouble getting along that first year when they were both alphas. And then why, why yeah. is Phil Jackson capable of making everyone get along somehow? It's incredible. <laughs> yep. Phil Jackson came over and then, uh, and, and then they did the three-peat. I, I remember the first year, um, everybody just felt like when Phil got there, this is like the bulls all over again. They're about to just three-peat. Everyone assumed that. And I remember um, one commentator, he said, he asked this guy, he says, when are you going to stop treating the Lakers as if they already won the championship? And he says, as soon as other teams stop celebrating like they just won the championship when they beat the Lakers. I love, yeah, the way, the way that people act when they beat a team is also really indicative of the team's strength and culture, like the Lions. Yeah. No one ever celebrates when they beat the Lions. No matter how the Lions could be 10 and 0 and facing an 0 and 10 team and lose. And they and that team would not celebrate like they accomplished a big thing. Because like they just don't, no one can there's no respect. You know, you can see it. You can see it. Oh my gosh. Um, what was the one? Oh, Phil, just speaking of Phil Jackson. Watching the last dance. I mean, I've always known about Phil and his like weird Zen stuff and whatever, but yeah. I, I, I loved watching and learning so much about him, but I realized that you are Phil Jackson, TK. That is your gift because Phil, in the presence of like ice cold alpha killers who don't put up with any bullshit, who are the farthest thing from cheesy in any way possible, they would sit there and tolerate Phil Jackson being like, close your eyes and imagine you are a buffalo in a rainbow. And they would just like do it. And like, that's you, you can get away with such cheesy stuff. And it has somehow it like has some depth because you have this like presence and Phil just had this presence like, well, this stuff seems crazy to me, but like this guy is something's working for him. You know, (laughs) that was what I thought. I was like, this is TK, man. This is TK. (laughs) I I thought you were thinking of me when uh, when Robin was like, I need a vacation. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> incredible the ability to keep him doing just enough and being just keeping his destructive tendencies just enough at bay that they could go win those three championships i mean like somebody deserves something for that you know dude for three years that that that, that was that was an amazing art form just like how to be a great teammate how to be a great coach like so many lessons and yeah because that dude like he lost it as soon as he lost chuck daly yep. his coach at the pistons and that sense of family and all that and he like from that moment on it was kind of like nobody including he even knew what he wanted what he got bored with everything does he even want to play basketball will he play for anybody is it 
And somehow the Pistons, I mean, the, the Bulls being able to get those three years and those three championships out of him was – that's incredible. So Cause he, you got to channel your, your cheesy meditation practices into find yourself a Dennis Rodman and give yourself a challenge. I got to get three championships out of this guy. You know? <laughs> I think I think BSV is my Dennis Robin. That's like the craziest thing in my life. <laughs> that's it. Bitcoin SV. That's perfect. And you fit in so well. That's that's so right. It's this crazy, unhinged Dennis Rodman like community. And you're just trying to be a Phil Jackson. You know you're not gonna be a Chuck Daly. You're never gonna be a family with it and create all <laughs> you just gotta get enough of it harnessed to be productive. I love that. <laughs> all right man we're gonna we're gonna wrap this thanks for uh thanks for taking the time to chat with me since um you know we don't really hang out anymore and uh you won't return my calls uh <laughs> hey man as, as kobe said friendships come and go but banners hang forever <laughs> <laughs> peace Let's out my some brother. championships man peace Later. out